Welcome to the second video for chapter seven, where we're gonna talk about water soluble vitamins. The learning objective for this video is to learn about the water soluble vitamins, including B vitamins and vitamin C. We already learned about the differences between fat soluble and water soluble vitamins and the fat soluble vitamins in part one of this chapter. Just as a refresher, we have vitamins as the umbrella term. Then they are broken down into water soluble vitamins and fat soluble vitamins, each of which have unique characteristics that you should be familiar with. The fat soluble vitamins we talked about in the part one, and that included A, D, E, and K. Now we are moving on to water soluble vitamins, and these are numbered, as you can see, B1, B2, B3, B5, B6, and so on. And they also have their technical name. So whatever I refer to them as in the slides is what we're gonna go by. If I don't mention them by their number or by their technical name, you don't have to know the one that I'm not referring to it as. Welcome to the second video for chapter seven, where we're gonna be talking about water soluble vitamins. The learning objective for this video is to learn about the water soluble vitamins, including B vitamins and vitamin C. I hope you watched part one, because that's where we discuss the differences between fat soluble and water soluble vitamins, and also learned about fat soluble vitamins. Just as a refresher, we have the umbrella term vitamins, which are essential non-caloric compounds under that umbrella term, we have water soluble vitamins and fat soluble vitamins. And today we're focusing on the water soluble vitamins. Water soluble vitamins includes the B vitamins and vitamin C. As a refresher, these ones are absorbed directly into the bloodstream. Most are not stored in the body Toxicities are unlikely, even if supplements are used, and many have overlapping roles, so they function in much the same way. We'll start with vitamin C. Vitamin C is also known as ascorbic acid. This is important for those of you who may go on to work in a hospital because you will see it listed as such in the medications list. Vitamin C is found in a wide range of fruits and vegetables. Oranges tend to be an easily recognized source by the general population, but we shouldn't forget things like bell peppers, broccoli, and strawberries are also excellent sources, but are less recognized. Gotta give them some credit. Functions of vitamin C, there are a couple. Vitamin C plays a critical role in the synthesis of connective tissues. This includes things like bones, teeth, skin, and tendons. So with inadequate vitamin C, you have difficulty producing these things. Vitamin C is necessary to produce a compound called carnitine. And this is a compound that helps transport fatty acids into cells. Finally, vitamin C serves as an antioxidant, which we saw in the previous lecture where it was helping to offset damage of free radicals. Vitamin C is interesting is that it can serve as an antioxidant in the GI tract. 
in that it prevents iron from being oxidized, and this will increase absorption. Some consequences of deficiency. It's not very common in the US, especially when there's an absence of disease or starvation. But if vitamin C deficiency is present, it has a name of scurvy. Symptoms, which I misspelled, include bleeding gums, loose teeth, and tiny red spots in the skin. It can also include poor wound healing and things like brittle hair. So you can see a picture here. Bleeding gums is a sign of vitamin D deficiency, vitamin C deficiency, excuse me. And then these red spots here. This can be on the face or the extremities, the legs or the arms. As for vitamin C toxicity, not easily achieved with food. And one interesting thing about vitamin C, it has a very wide range of safe intake. So 10 milligrams, to two grams, significant difference, as you can see with the image on the right. The first symptom of toxicity is usually GI distress. So as mentioned before, unlikely to occur with food, only supplements. You see this wide range. For here, we have the DRI, the 90 milligrams for men, 75 for women, and you have an acceptable intake, you know, really all the way up to this uh, two grams. So it's you know, many times over what is an acceptable amount or the appropriate amount to take. Another thing to note here is you can see that smokers have an increased need for vitamin C, and that's because the damage from smoke um, includes damage of vitamin C. I stand corrected there. Smoking increases free radical production, and so there's an increased need for vitamin C to combat that. Vitamin C in cooking is important to recognize because vitamin C is sensitive to heat and oxygen. Because of this improper handling or cooking of foods can lead to significant decreases in the amount of vitamin C in our food. I want you to remember three strategies to maximize vitamin C content. This includes minimizing water when steaming vegetables, and using a cover. If you pre-cut food in advance, store it in an airtight container, and then avoid high cooking temperatures and long cooking times. So these are all techniques to reduce very high heat, to reduce exposure to oxygen, and reduce the ability of vitamin C to leach out into the cooking water. So in most instances, if you're steaming vegetables, you wanna steam with a very small amount of water. You wanna use a cover to trap the vitamin C in there, and you don't wanna cook for a very long time. Cook just so that the vegetables are pierced easily with a fork. Here's our summary slide for vitamin C. Just like last lecture, no need to know the specific recommendations for intake, but important to know the chief functions and the deficiency disease, as well as the name of it. The source is wide range of fruits and vegetables.
Before looking at individual B vitamins, we will talk about the B vitamins in unison. This is because many of the B vitamins have overlapping functions. This function is that they serve as coenzymes, which we'll see in an upcoming slide, and also that they play a role in energy metabolism or the production of energy in the body. Vitamin B12 and folate overlap with their role in cell multiplication and the deficiency of either one will result in anemia. Now we've seen enzymes a couple times. We saw them when we talked about digestion. We saw them in the proteins video. Now we'll see what a coenzyme is. What we know about enzymes is that they facilitate chemical reaction in the body. This can include bringing two compounds together or splitting two compounds apart. So you have this, the compounds, you have the enzyme, and then sometimes you'll have a coenzyme sitting on that and sitting on that enzyme. So the coenzyme is necessary for the enzyme to accomplish its goal. The vitamins, B vitamins, often serve as part of coenzymes. And so without them, the necessary enzymatic activity cannot occur. Now we will dive into individual B vitamins. The first one being thiamine. Thiamine plays a role in the energy metabolism of all cells. It also helps to maintain nerve cell membranes. The deficiency disease of thiamine is called beriberi, and symptoms of beriberi include a loss of sensation in the hands, feet, and muscular weakness. A severe thiamine deficiency can result in something called wernicke korsakoff syndrome. This is common in alcoholics as they have decreased absorption of thiamine and increased excretion of the vitamin. It will result in confusion, memory loss, jerk, jerky eye movements, and a staggering gait. In some instances, wernicke korsakoff syndrome can be irreversible. Here's our summary slide for thiamine, found in sufficient quantities in a wide ra uh, range of foods. Interesting enough, pork chops tend to be a very good source of thiamine. Our second one is niacin. This, like thiamine, plays a role in the energy metabolism of all cells. And the deficiency disease of niacin is called pellagra. Pellagra is characterized by the four Ds. They are diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia, and death. And I think if there's anything positive about death is that once you achieve death, you don't have to worry about the first three. I'm kidding, of course. So on the right-hand side, you can see a picture of skin changes due to a niacin deficiency. That would be our dermatitis. Dementia is when somebody is going to develop altered mental status. Confusion is a primary symptom of de uh, dementia. Niacin used to be used as a medication to improve blood lipid profile. So if somebody has high triglycerides, high cholesterol, sometimes they will be put on niacin. This is rare in practice today due to, to there being more effective alternatives that have fewer side effects. 
high dosage of niacin can also contribute to liver injury and glucose intolerance. So it's kind of fallen out a favor of practitioners because there's better options available. Those that work better and have less side effects. Here's our summary slide. Nothing really of note on this page. Next up, we have folate. This one plays a role in cell production and DNA synthesis. A deficiency during pregnancy results in neural tube defects. One common neural tube defect is spina bifida, which involves incomplete closure of the spine. So it is very important to ensure adequacy of intake leading up to pregnancy and the very early stages of pregnancy. On the left, we have a picture of a neural tube defect. You can see the incomplete closure of the spine. Consequences of this condition can vary in their severity from being very mild to extremely debil debilitating, both physically and uh, having intellectual impact. Because folate intake is so important, there have been global initiatives to increase the amount in the food supply, most prominently through the fortification of grains. What this means is that a significant amount of folate is added to grain products to ensure that intake reaches adequacy. This was started in the US in 1997. I'm not sure about other countries, but you can see that when this is done, they found that the number of neural tube defects has fallen tremendously. Here is our summary slide. Good sources of folate include beans and lentils and leafy green vegetables. That brings us to vitamin B12, which is linked to folate. That's because vitamin B12 serves as a coenzyme in several reactions, one of which is the activation of folate. You can see this is the active form of folate that we want in the body. But once we eat it and it's absorbed into our bloodstream, much of it is in this form methylfolate. And in order to become the active form, the methylfolate is dependent on an enzyme that has B12 as a coenzyme. So if you have a B12 deficiency, all of this methylfolate gets stuck in this form. It's unable to become activated. So when you have a B12 deficiency, you're gonna end up with a folate deficiency as well. Vitamin B12 also helps to maintain nerve fibers. As such, deficiency results in malfunctioning of nerves. It can also lead to altered mental status. I've mentioned this previously, but a deficiency of vitamin B12 or folate will result in anemia. This is another thing that I've mentioned before, but vitamin B12 is only found in animal products. So vegans and strict vegetarians are encouraged to take a daily supplement. Also vitamin B12 relies on stomach acid and something called intrinsic factor for absorption. 
A deficiency of either will lead to deficiency through malabsorption. When somebody does not have adequate intrinsic factor and develops anemia, they call it a pernicious anemia. One fun fact about vitamin B12 is that it's unique as a water-soluble vitamin because we do store a good amount of it in the liver. And this is the reason why a deficiency can take many years to develop. Here is our summary slide for vitamin B12. As you can see, all animal-based foods, with the exception of the enriched cereal. The vitamin B12 is not found in there naturally, but is added through the process of fortification. Your key takeaways for water-soluble vitamins is that apart from vitamin B12, the best sources are generally plant-based. And to achieve your water-soluble vitamin needs, you'll want to meet your goal fruit, vegetable, and grain intake. Excuse my misspelling of grain as gain. Vitamin B12 is only found in animal-based foods. We've seen that many times now, so that may be a question on the exam. Also, apart from vitamin B12, water-soluble vitamins are not stored in the body. This emphasizes the importance of maintaining adequate intake day in and day out. A deficiency can arise in days to weeks versus months or years, which you'll see with the fat soluble vitamins and vitamin B12. That is it. Thank you guys for watching this second video for chapter seven. Chapter eight will be on water and minerals.